Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? Is this volume good? You guys can hear me all right? All right, great. So I am Robert Murphy, and I am giving the talk today on Rothbardians versus free bankers on fraction reserve banking. Before I jump in, let me just say this is the first time I've spoken to you guys. So we, we like to joke around and whatever, but this really is the best uh, week on land, is the caveat Tom gave, uh, of the year. And I really do encourage you, you know, try to get enough sleep so that you're, you're not groggy during the sessions. And, you know, you really just want to absorb as much out of this week as possible. I know on the faculty's side, we get really excited just like watching you guys go through and, you know, knowing that some of you, it's your first time, like, oh, they went to this lecture, this, you know, it's like how, how much you're, you're learning in terms of being trained in the, the ways of the Jedi Knights and, and so forth. So <laughs> it's good. Also, I should mention for those of you who, you know, aren't used to this, what you may not appreciate, I mean, I'm sure you enjoy as it's occurring, but we, just to stop back and reflect, it's a, it's a conference, a seminar, a week-long thing of a bunch of economists, and most of them are pretty good public speakers, right? <laughs> I'm not talking about David Gordon, but, <laughs> but, but you see, and, and so it, that's also something, and it's great, it's like a competition, right, that each person, they really prepare, I mean, you notice like Harmon when she was up here saying, oh, I had to work on a joke or whatever, so it's really good that just we, we you know, we're really trying to engage you guys. I, I do have one quibble with Tom's talk, and of course, Tom's a phenomenal speaker, he gets everybody fired up. He gets me really energetic and wanting to, you know, go do some Austrian economics out there. And, and I'm very grateful for everything I've learned from Tom's public speaking. I just want to say that officially. Uh, the one thing, though, that I, he says this a lot, he uses that he once he heard it from McCloskey, he has this as his sort of pet example. It's, to me, it seems out of sort of odd. He used to remember he was talking about the Burgundy uh, people out in the vineyards who would have to hibernate because it was, you know, they were so poor. And they could. To me, sleeping through the winter sounds awesome. I don't know. <laughs> Why, he's, why that's supposed to be the example of how horrible things used to be. I mean, I, I could go socialist if it means we get to sleep. <laughs> All right. Okay, so for this talk, uh, this is a new one. This is the first time I've given this. So let me just, I guess, apologize on the front end. It's tricky to do a talk like this with only 45 minutes with you guys because some people here are literally not even economics majors, right? Their philosophy or history or whatever, and you know, some professor told them, hey, you might be interested in this conference. So I can't really jump into the nitty gritty details. So if you're somebody who has read a lot in this debate, um, I, I'm not gonna get into the technicalities here, but what I am gonna give you is, I think, a, a way to approach it and, and see it perhaps from a new perspective. And there's a lot of things in this debate that even to me, and I'll talk, I'll give you the specifics in a minute here as, as I go through the talk, but just to sort of frame it on the front end, that I misunderstood a lot of what Mises said in this debate and I was confused and I thought there was some, uh, you know, he vacillated and then now, uh, because I recently debated George Selgin on this stuff, in preparing for that, my eyes were opened, right? And it, it really was, I was reading things and seeing them in a new light, and I was like, oh, wow, that makes total sense now that I see it from this perspective. So I'll at least give you that. So basically what I'm trying to do is introduce the topic, obviously, for those of you who don't know anything about it, but for those even who are seasoned veterans in this genre, I will uh, tr try to give you a way of going and looking at this stuff so when you do further reading. So for those who don't know, this is probably the biggest dispute within Austrian circles. So people who call themselves Austrian economists, it's probably the biggest technical dispute, at least of the last 20 years. It, it's certainly one of the top two or three, but for, yeah, I would say it's, it's the, the most uh, heated one, where it really is just a, you know, a, a technical issue, as, as we'll see. So fractional reserve banking, let me make sure I don't lose anybody right up front. Fractional reserve banking means a commercial bank when someone comes and gives them a $100 bill, you know, a green piece of paper that goes into their checking account that the bank, I don't want to shock anybody, they don't just put it in the vault with your name on it, right? They lend out a bunch of that money. And so when you say how much of the what's called demand deposits are on reserve, it's only a fractional amount. It's not 100% of reserves. Whereas 100% reserves means for those types of bank accounts, that are supposed to be immediately demandable, where the customer shows up and says, give me my money that you were just holding for me, then uh, they, they have it all, they're you know, able to, to redeem it upon demand. Okay, so th that's what the argument is over, and then as we go through it, I'll show you there's different nuances, and part of what's happening in this debate, I think, is people are talking past each other, but there really is legitimate clash as well. So that's, those are the kinds of things I'll try to outline for you in this talk. Okay, so, First of all, a note on quotation marks. You'll know in the schedule and then here, you know, they have these, they have it in quotation marks. 
And even you might hear, I'll probably stop doing it just to not be obnoxious about it. But a lot of times when you'll hear Rothbardians speaking, they will say, you know, versus the free bankers, you know, and they'll inflect their voice to show you that they're putting it in quotation marks. Or, I mean, they might even go full Dr. Evil and eat <laughs> free bankers. Are, for possible people online or, or foreigners, maybe don't, this is from the Austin Powers movies, and this is the villain, and he would do things like, we have developed a laser beam, and then he would go through and, and talk about his latest plan for world domination. All right, so why are we doing that, besides just being obnoxious? The reason we're saying they're free bankers, or they're talking about the free banking position, is that actually that's a bit uh, of a misnomer in the sense that it's, because the people who use that term, right, so the, the distinction is the Rothbardians who are for 100% reserve banking versus the so-called free bankers, who many of them call themselves Austrians, but what they say is, hey, we're not central planners. We don't want the government to regulate it. Let banks choose whatever reserve ratio they want, okay? So they got to, you know, follow their contracts. If they say to their customers, hey, whenever you show up and you want to pull money out of your checking account, we'll be able to give it to you. And if there's a bank run and they get caught with their pants down, then okay, they should get in legal trouble, just like any entity, any firm in the economy that doesn't live up to its contractual obligations has consequences. But we're not going to, at the outset, you know, have some regulation on the banking sector saying you have to have 100% reserves. Right? So that's their position. So that's why they call themselves, hey, we're free bankers. We're not going to micromanage the banks and have them set their particular policies, just like, you know, how much should they charge for a checking account or what should the rate of interest they pay on deposits be? We're not going to tell them that. We're, we're free market laissez-faire people. So who are we to tell them what reserve ratio to hold, right? So that's where they're coming from with that label. But as we'll see, the Rothbardians, the ones who are for 100% reserves, they are saying, and I should say, you can be a Rothbardian and not be for 100% reserves. But in this, just for convenience, I'm going to use those terms interchangeably. Where they're coming from is many of them think it's actually fraud, and I'll get to that in a minute, and for sure they think that it sets in motion the boom-bust cycle, okay? And so like for Murray Rothbard himself, his position was that in a free society, because he thought fractional reserve banking was inherently fraudulent, it wouldn't be legal, right? And, and, and it wasn't, you know, that wasn't like a, a statist perspective. Just to give you a silly analogy, Rothbard would also say in a free society, going in and at gunpoint robbing a convenience store would be illegal. And it would be silly for someone on the other side to say, oh, so you want the government to regulate the use of ski masks and shotguns? Ooh, I thought you were libertarian. You see how that would be kind of like, what are you talking about? I'm just talking about the, so likewise, if you think that 100%, or sorry, if you think fractional reserve banking is inherently fraudulent, and oh, by the way, it causes the boom bust cycle, then you can see why you might say in a free society, the courts wouldn't uphold that and da da da. And then it would be a sort of, you know, offshoot to say, okay, given right now that we don't live in a free society and we don't have free market judges, what should government policies be? And there, you know, you could have all kinds of positions. You could think in a free society, the legal system wouldn't uphold it, but given that what we are right now, I don't want, you know, the Federal Reserve coming in and regulate, you know, so there's all sorts of nuanced positions you could have, but I'm just pointing out, this is why standard Rothbardians actually bristle somewhat at the label free banking, but, you know, the name, the label stuck, so we got to use it. Okay, also I want to point out there is a tendency, and this is something that I didn't even fully realize until recently. Um, sometimes, in, if you'll read, especially like online debates where it's more casual of free bankers going head-to-head -head with Rothbardians on this issue, you will get the impression, or someone might explicitly say it, oh yeah, that only those cranky Rothbardians support or endorse 100% reserve banking. Like, who the heck, don't they know this is modern banking? This is like... Give me a break. Everybody since the 1800s knows this is how modern banking and finance works. Give me a break, you Neanderthals. Okay, and so I'm saying that is demonstrably false, that perspective. It, you could, you know, maybe 100% reserve banking is, is a bad idea, but the idea that that is just something that these cranky Rothbardians endorse is, is demonstrably false. So there have been plenty of reputable big-shot economists throughout the decades who have also pr put forth proposals for 100% reserve banking, including Frank Knight, Irving Fisher, Hayek, uh, Milton Friedman. And by the way, for the, these two here, what, what it's referred to in modern parlance is the Chicago plan. If you just talk to a random economist and say, 
first of all, why are you talking to a random economist? That's kind of weird. But if you did and you said, hey, what's the Chicago plan? And you didn't even give any context. Many of them would probably say, oh, yeah, that's the thing about um, enforcing 100% reserve banking, right? Okay, so, I mean, that's how well-known that phrase is, that that's what the Chicago plan means, right? It's, it's not about sending arms to Pinochet. It's, it's the Chicago plan <laughs> of banking. I didn't say that, did I? All right. So, okay. Milton, so Hayek also, again, that might surprise you, um, he has passages, and to their credit, like guys like Larry White acknowledge this. You know, they, they say, yeah, if you're, like he, I think Larry actually has an article on, I'm, I forget the exact title, but it's something like, how come Hayek didn't agree with us on this? I mean, he's normally so good. You know, it's, it's something like along those like where he's going through it explaining this is where Hayek was coming from just as a matter of history of economic thought. But again, it's demonstrably false to say it's only those cranky Rothbardians and the people, you know, in Rothbard's wake who might think this. Hayek has places where he flirts with these ideas. Friedman also for a period. And then more recently, even Edward Prescott, okay, after the 2008 financial crisis, he was doing the circuit. He, had, he presented at the Jackson Hole thing, I think, you know, where the, the people meet for central banking. And we had a proposal for basically 100% reserve banking. Okay, because they all, all, they're coming from different perspectives, obviously. It's not that all these people, you know, it's not that Prescott read human action and was like, wow, I've been a fool my whole life. And that's, that's not what happened. But my point is this idea of tying instability in financial markets and the broader economy to the practice of fractured reserve banking is something many economists from different uh, lines of thought have, have said. So, you know, in light of all these people who have favored 100% reserve banking, I think uh, Adam Sandler would say, not too shabby. Okay. <laughs> I want to just keep doing references until only one person's laughing by the end. <laughs> all right. So, some of the Austrian participants in this debate, George Selgin and Larry White are the two big guns in this. Uh, Steve Horowitz also has a book on this, you know, the free banking position. Uh, you could say versus, so I'll list just some. There's, there's tons of people, and this debate has raged literally for more than decades. So I'm just giving you some of the people that are actually you know, at this seminar this week. You've got Guido Hulsman. You've got Walter Block. You've got Joe Salerno. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Honest mistake. That's actually Eric Clapton, but I meant to put up a Joe Salerno post. You've also got the present Murphy. Now, what I mean by that is... I, in my current incarnation, think this because this is something new. I told you I was de debating George Selgin just to happen a few months ago, and so it was my preparation that I'd come to my present position. Over the years, when I was younger, I actually was in favor of uh, fractional reserve banking, and then it was just over time. I mean, obviously, I thought banks can do whatever they want, and if 100% if reserves is what they want to do, fine, but over time now, and especially, like I say, in preparation I, I have moved, I went from just thinking something's really weird when I learned the accounting of it. I was gonna do it for you guys here, but it, it would take too much time. And if you don't know how balance sheets work, it would be completely mysterious to you. But if you know how balance sheets work and you go and look at what banks do when they engage in fractional reserve banking, it is freaky. They, that's where this you know, phrase creating money out of thin air comes from. Let me just say this, that's not something that only fiat money central banks do. In the modern, legal and regulatory framework, there is a legitimate sense in which commercial banks can create money. They can make decisions that make M1 go up, if I put it that way. Okay, so just make sure you realize that this is not something that only central banks do. This is something that commercial banks do. Okay, and so that's, you know, so now I'm on this side, whereas before I was, uh, you know, so I'll put young Murphy over here. And now I'm going to show a picture. It's before the beard, just so I, I do... I do look different. I just want to mention, <laughs> I was studying a lot, didn't get outside very much. So in all seriousness, let me just, this brings up an interesting point too. So I was, you know, a grad student. I was here. I was a fellow, like some of you are, you know, here. I went to all the Mises used once, you know, I was the right age and I kept coming. And people knew I was uh, okay with fractional reserve banking at the time, right? It's not like that I got excommunicated or something, all right? So there's this idea that this is a cult and that you know we, we you, you can't deviate from Rothbard's line or else they, that's really not true. Okay, that I mean, when you're a group of people who like certain scholars who are not well known outside of you know certain circles or who at least aren't cited, 
you welcome like someone coming in who wants to criticize Rothbard and something, that's great, right? It's like, oh, f- finally, someone who's read Rothbard and appreciates he's worth responding and crit- criticizing. You see what I'm saying? So again, if you're new here and you've heard rumors that you're not allowed to disagree with Rothbard, that is, that is really not true, and I just want to officially say that. Okay, so another misunderstanding or misconception is that 100% reserve banking wouldn't even work, right? That banks couldn't even exist in a system like that. And I'll, I've even heard professional economists, when they first encounter the idea that, oh my gosh, there's some Rothbardians out there who are in favor of 100% reserve banking, and they recoil and say, you know, what? That, that's how banks work. How, how else would a bank make money? So let me make sure you see where they're coming from first before I show why this isn't correct, this objection. So the idea is, you go to a bank and you, uh, you know, give them $1,000 that's in your checking account, and they're paying you interest on that, a, a, a paltry rate, especially in modern times, but, you know, recent times, but, you know, they give you an interest rate. And then if the bank isn't going to take that money and lend it out to someone at a higher interest rate and earn that spread, how can the bank stay in business, right? How, how could checking accounts even be possible? How are they making money? If you, you know, how are they going to pay you, right? So that's the objection. They're thinking that's how banks work. They're credit intermediaries. What are you talking about? 100% reserve banking? That doesn't even make any sense. All right, that's like saying McDonald's you know, can't charge you more than they pay for their resources or something. What, how, how's that possible? So there's two distinct functions that commercial banks serve, and you have to keep them at least conceptually distinct to see how this is possible. So what the, the reason there's confusion is that in our modern environment with fractional reserve banking where you know, the, the legal system's fine with it and so on, that it, it gets blurry. But there's two distinct functions. So the first one is that banks could have demand deposits that they're offering to customers. So that term demand means you know, your money can be returned to you upon demand. That's what it means. And the, the point of that would be for convenience or safety, right? That you have, let's say you got $10,000 in, in currency. That's risky to, just to keep on your person or even in your house in a safe. You know, there could be a fire, somebody could break in. And so that's one function that the bank serves for the community is they have much more secure vaults, they have insurance, they have armed guards and blah, blah, blah. And so you can go ahead and put your money there. It's just a safer place to keep it. And then there's also the convenience that they have an ATM network around the world. They have agreements with restaurants and whatever, merchants. And so just with your bank card, you can either go to an ATM and get cash all over the place, or you can just be somewhere and swipe your card, right? So it's just an easy way to keep track of where your money is being held in your name so you can spend it in a very convenient fashion. Okay, so, and by the way, that's why I'm actually not calling this a warehouse right here because it's actually better than a warehouse or it's doing more than a a, a mere warehouse does, right? If you put grain in a silo or something, it's not that you can go all over the world and get a machine that spits out grain, right? And so you can see how what they, what banks do with, with demand deposits is actually goes beyond what the term warehouse might suggest. Okay, the other distinct conceptual function is time deposits for credit intermediation, right? So banks do also act as credit intermediaries. And think of this as a savings account or like a certificate of deposit, a CD. That's what that stands for. If you heard of banks, you know, selling CDs with with certain uh, associated interest rates or yields. Okay, so here, you might go to the bank, you've got $1,000 that you want to lend out and earn interest on. So you go to the bank, you buy a $1,000 CD, and what that says is the bank's promising you, obviously I'm just making these numbers up, they'll say in 12 months time, the bearer of this note, this, this CD, redeems it and gets $1,050. Okay, so there's the implied 5% interest rate on that for the one year loan. And then they take the $1,000 and they go lend it to somebody else, presumably for more than 5% a year. And so there's where the bank's earning the spread, and that's where the bank is connecting the savers and the borrowers, right? Because this, again, is a genuine social function that you've got in society, you've got a bunch of people who want to borrow money, like a young couple. They both have good jobs, so they know they have a future income stream, but they want to buy a $300,000 house right now. They don't have $300,000 right now, but they, you know, over time, have plenty of income coming in, they think. And then you've got thousands of people in the community who want to save you know, $50, $100 a month, let's say, and put it somewhere where it's going to earn interest. It would be a huge coordination problem for those thousands of little savers to all pool their money to give 
a mortgage to that one couple, besides just them all coordinating, it would be very risky. If that one couple, you know, if they lose their jobs and default on that loan, all those people lose all their savings or a portion of them. Okay, and so that's where, you know, the bank is the, the middleman, if you will. So all the savers in the community can put their funds with the bank. It's very safe. And then the bank makes a bunch of mortgage loans and other business loans and so forth to other borrowers. And the bank has credit officers, credit officials, who ostensibly at least are good at assessing risk and so on and charging the appropriate interest rate and so forth. Okay, so that's the, the textbook function of a bank serving as a credit intermediary. And obviously other financial institutions do similar things. It's not just commercial banks, but a commercial bank could do that. So those are distinct things. And under 100% reserves, banks would have to charge for their warehouse services just like other storage facilities. Okay, so that's the, the answer when people say, how could a bank make money if it's not engaging in fractional reserve banking? Well, if we're talking about the, the time deposits, so notice with the thing with the $1,000 buying the $1,000 CD, you don't have access to that money for the year. If you need cash, you can go sell the CD to the open market. You might find someone else in the community who's willing to pay you money, but there's no guarantee, and it's not that the bank gives you the money. right? The bank is saying when they issue that CD and the, the numbers I dreamed up, they're saying we are taking this money you're giving us. It's our money now. You're lending it to us. We just owe you payback in a year if it's a certain interest rate. Okay, whereas with a demand deposit, the deal is you're giving us this money and you can show up whenever you want and we'll give it to you. All right, so the, my point is in that first scenario, yeah, the bank would have to make its money somehow, but that's not impossible. It's very convenient to have checking accounts and people would be willing to pay for that, right? It, we don't know how they would do it. Maybe the bank would say every time you use a check or swipe your debit card, we charge you 50 cents or something. You know, who knows? Maybe they charge you a percentage up to a ceiling. Maybe they would just charge you an annual fee so long as you didn't use it you know, a certain number of times. Who knows? But like right now, people pay fees to use an ATM. Or if, they, if you use an ATM that's not your bank's ATM, you pay a little fee. It's, right? Imagine someone saying, oh, ATMs wouldn't work because you'd have to pay money to get your own money, but people wouldn't stand for that. That's crazy. No, it's, if it's a very convenient thing, people pay for it. That's how markets work. Okay, so... Another distinction that I want to make, so this is now where we're really getting into the heart of this debate, the way Austrians engage in it, is the fraud versus economic consequences. So Rothbard and some of his followers, uh, particularly uh, Huerto de Soto in his book on money and banking, uh, Hoppe stresses this a lot, I think Walter Block and co-authors stress this point. Um, they say that fractional reserve banking is inherently fraudulent, and to do so, they rely both on logic and history. Okay, so here I'm not going to, I'm just going to mention this. So I'm not personally like dismissing this and saying this is wrong or this is irrelevant. I'm just saying this is not something that like when I debated Selgin, I didn't happen to get into this thing. All right, but I am just mentioning there is this, this train of thought within the, these camps. And where they're coming from, just to give you an idea, is they're saying, just think about it. It's by its very nature, there's something odd about fractional reserve banking where you're depositing a good money with somebody that's holding it and you have a title, a claim to it, and then if they lend it out to somebody else, it's like there's two people in the community who both think they're the owner of that same piece of property. And notice, it's not like shares of corporate stock, right? So there's nothing illogical about two partners being 50% owners each of a company. You know, there's nothing weird about that. But what they're saying is you can't have two people who are 100% owners of the same property. And yet there's a sense in fractional reserve banking in which that happens. So you put your money in a checking account. Someone says, hey, how much do you have in there? How much could you get? You, you, know, you could put it in and check your balance. This is $1,000. You think you have $1,000 in there. But if the bank has taken 900 of it and lent it out to someone else, and that's literally currency now in that guy's wallet, if you say to him, who owns that $900 in your wallet? He's going to say, I do. And yet there's a sense you're still walking around town thinking you have $1,000 in your checking account. So there's a sense in which you think you own that $900. Okay, so that's where they're coming from. They're just saying as a matter of logic, that doesn't make sense. And so we shouldn't be surprised, they would continue, if weird economic consequences ensue from entities engaging what is clearly illogical transactions, okay, that you can't build something up on irrationality, it would, it would collapse. Okay, so that's, wh that's where they're coming from. Also in terms of history, so here I'm, I'm not qualified to, to render judgment on this, but there are, Scott, again, DeSoto's the, the 
I think probably the best text to, to start with, at least on this, saying that you know, there, there was the tradition coming from the common law and going back to Rome and so forth about the difference between different types of contracts like bailment contracts versus loans and things like that, and that it was a deliberate attempt by authorities to sort of give encouragement to the financial sector and financialization where they decided in legal cases at some point, I think the change happened like in the 1800s, I could be wrong about that, where they all of a sudden said that, oh, when you deposit money with a bank, you're really just lending them the money. And so, there, so notice there's a distinction there, right? If you, some of, a lot of you are students, you know how you, if you're going to go home for the summer, you put your, your stuff in storage, like, you know, if you're moving out of your apartment near your college, but you're going home and you have some stuff there and you put it in storage, it would be weird if you learn later that the people running those storage facilities were renting out your bicycle or they were renting out your winter coat. And they were like, no, 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 but by the time you got back here, we had it back in there, so what's your problem? You know, we didn't default on our contract. You lent it to us, right? And you would say, no, I, I wasn't lending it to you. I was, you were storing it for me. You, I was putting it there for safekeeping. Okay, so DeSoto and others, they make the claim that legally speaking, that was what the understanding was, like in the Middle Ages, let's say, as banking started to develop. And then it was at some point a shift in the legal treatment of it, and they're claiming, and Hulsman gets into this too in some of his writings on this, and they're claiming that this was not you know, some cool laissez-faire thing and the judges just in the common law tradition saw the light and started rendering opinions that made more sense. They were saying it was a deliberate um, intervention. So you take that for, for what it's worth, but that's where they're coming from. Whereas the free bankers, um, they, so for one thing, they appeal to common knowledge, and they're just saying, give me a break. Everybody knows, if you think about it for two seconds, that the commercial bank isn't keeping your money on deposit. How else are they, how are they paying you interest? Duh. Everybody, you know, has seen the Jimmy Stewart movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where there's a bank run. Everyone knows bank runs are possible, so clearly, you know, th this, this isn't, how can it be fraud if everyone knows what's going on, right? So that's, that's one element. And then with the history they will say things like, look, it, it's never been illegal to have 100% reserves. And so, the, hey, the, it's the market test. Banks have gone through and issued fractional reserve banking. Clearly, consumers apparently prefer to have their money you know, on deposit where there's a chance if they show up, they won't have their money, but they, get, they earn interest rather than a totally safe 100% reserve bank where they would have to pay fees to keep the thing running. Okay, so that's what, what their position is. Okay, so what I found helpful when I was getting ready for my debate with George Selgin on this stuff is Salerno is, you know, he's kind of just taking a middle ground here, and he's saying, look, I'm not talking about the fraud stuff. What I want to focus on are the economic consequences of fractional reserve banking. So whether you think it's fraudulent or not, the, the undisputed matter Salerno thinks in the Austrian tradition is that issuing what's called fiduciary media, so let me just tell you that phrase. So fiduciary media... This comes out of the Misesian treatment of money and banking. The idea is that there's these things called money substitutes. So you've got the real money, like gold, let's say gold coins, and then a money substitute would be a claim on the money that everybody is sure is, you know, is defensible, is going to be redeemed, and it's immediate. You know, so it's not something saying, I owe you 10 gold coins in 12 months. It's saying the owner of this piece of paper can present it at any bank branch, let's say, and immediately receive 10 gold coins. So that would be a money substitute. Now, within the class of money substitutes, there's money certificates, which are backed up 100% by reserves in the vault, and then there's fiduciary media. So if a bank issues, a, so people put 1,000 pounds of gold, let's say, on deposit with one bank, and they issue out claim tickets to 1,100 pounds of gold, then 100 of those tickets or 100 pounds worth of those tickets would be fiduciary media. Okay, so that's, and it's also called credit expansion when a bank does that. When it issues new fiduciary media entering the economy, that's what Mises calls credit expansion. Okay, so, so Salerno is saying cre credit expansion is what sets in motion the boom-bust cycle in Austrian business cycle theory. Now, I think actually you guys haven't seen that lecture, right? Isn't that later? Is it today or tomorrow from Garrison on Austrian business cycle theory? Okay, so don't be confused, and this is something that I wasn't even fully uh, cognizant of until later on, is that there's a tendency, and, and I would do this, like if I'm on a radio show talking about the housing bubble, I would spend most of my time talking about what Alan Greenspan did and then Ben Bernanke did, and it leads you to believe the Austrian business cycle is about central bank policy. 
So certainly central banks can exacerbate it, but Mises developed his theory of the business cycle even before the Federal Reserve existed. And the U.S. had had business cycles, financial panics or depression with a small d, before then, like in the 1800s. So Mises clearly thought the business cycle was not merely something that central banks caused. It was something inherent in a certain practice in the banking sector, which, of course, central banks amplified and exaggerated. But the point is, Austrian business cycle theory and the way Mises and Hayek developed it is not about central banks screwing things up. It's about how, uh, if there's credit expansion, that can make interest rates artificially low. Okay, so that's what Salerno says. That's really the technical economic issue at play here. Sure, let philosophers and legal theorists also debate the legality or the possible morality, what have you, of fractional reserve banking, but I, Joe Salerno, I'm an economist. That's what I'm talking about here. Okay, so let's... So now we're, you know, we're homing in on, on this. So the nuanced position of Mises. So there, there's an apparent paradox here that Mises at times condemns fractional reserve banking in his writings, yet elsewhere he praises free banking. Okay, and so, and, and this is what confused me when I was younger and I was at least open to the fractional reserve banking position I thought, you know, the people in that camp would offer a lot of quotations from Mises, and they would say, look at Mises is on board with us, it's just you cranky Rothbardians who don't get it. And it looked pretty compelling to me at the time. And I was like, yeah, I mean, he's praising free, but he said, I don't have the quotes at my fingertips, but he says stuff like, even in human action, he also says it earlier, he says things like, um, you know, laissez-faire should never have been abandoned in banking, that the only way to ensure stability in the financial sector is to have a return to free banking. That's, or free banking is the only thing that can uh, avoid the recurring boom-bust cycle. Okay, so if you're somebody like Larry White or Selgin, that looks like a slam dunk. You know, you're quoting Mises, endorsing free banking, what's the problem? But then the 100% reserve people, the Rothbardians in this tradition, can also point, for example, here's one... So this is from human action, right? So it's not like I'm going to when Mises was an angry young man or something. This is the mature Mises. You know, he's so upset about how they lost in the trench warfare. He can't believe it. All right. So uh, human action, the scholar's edition. This is from page 439, footnote 17. Let's not overlook footnote 17, all right? I'm sick of people overlooking footnote 17. Page 439, this is Mises. The notion of normal credit expansion is absurd. Issuance of additional fiduciary media no matter what its quantity may be, always sets in motion those changes in the price structure, the description of which is the task of the theory of the trade cycle. Okay, so he's writing in this very Germanic style. You might have, that might be hard to, to hear and translate, but he's saying there's no such thing as a normal credit expansion. Any issue of new fiduciary media sets in motion the trade cycle. Okay, that, that's what Mises is talking about. By the way, that wasn't just my voice doing it. Mises it really does have quotation marks. He says, the notion of normal credit expansion, right? And so it's, he himself is doing the Dr. Evil thing also. My latest plan to overcome Austin Powers, I will have the commercial banks issue normal credit expansion, right? <laughs> uh, excuse me, Dr. Evil. What is it, number two? There's no such thing as normal credit expansion. It always sets in motion the trade cycle. People, I've been frozen for 30 freaking years here. I haven't read human action. Throw me a bone. I'm only quasi-Austrian. Okay. <laughs> the six of you who have seen that movie really like that part. All right. Guido just walked in. I'm like, he's not going to wonder, what am I doing? All right. Okay, so, what, so what's the resolution here? It, it's, it's, it's a paradox. Mises, on the one hand, seems to agree with guys like Salerno and Rothbard who are saying any credit expansion causes the boom-bust cycle. Hang on, let me just, I don't want people to think I'm being slippery. Mises concludes that footnote by saying, of course, if the additional amount issued is not large, neither are the inevitable effects of the expansion. Okay, so, and this also ties into where Mises is coming from, why he's not contradicting himself. So he's saying any credit expansion sets in motion the boom-bust cycle, but of course, if it's a tiny little credit expansion, it's going to be a little business cycle, right? So that's what his position is. And so how can it be that he also has those passages where he endorses free banking? And so the answer is, and this is where I saw the best expression of this in Salerno, but you know, others believe this as well, where, and, and I'm saying he reconciles all, and I'm putting it in question marks just because I'm not claiming I've read every single thing Mises ever wrote, but in all, when I was, you know, the months I was preparing for that debate with Selgin, and I was reading the various things from Mises, 
once I had this possibility in mind, everything made sense that Mises wrote throughout his career. Because he, he has all sorts of things. Like if you look at the th- what is called the theory of money and credit, the current version of it, there's essays that are included in there that came out later. And he has proposals for like how to return to monetary stability in the United States or some hypothetical little country somewhere. And you know, he has various things talking about, well, they should freeze the, you know, the, the lock in the price of gold in terms of their currency and then insist on 100% reserves from that point forward and da 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 And so I'm saying all that stuff, like his classic canonical treatment of human action, his earlier stuff in the theory of money and credit, his later you know, policy proposals, if you will, and all that stuff, this makes it all make perfect sense. Again, it doesn't mean he's right. We're not saying that, oh, because Mises said it, it's right, but it's just showing there is a consistency there and so the, the point is, he was saying that, yeah, the, uh, credit expansion, the issue of new fiduciary media, so in, you know, fr- fractional reserve banking, that necessarily causes the boom-bust cycle in the way the Austrians talk about it. And if you think about it, that makes sense, right? Because wh- what is the, the boom-bust cycle? And again, if you haven't heard it yet, you wouldn't know, but that's what the lecture that's coming up later, is that the interest rate is not doing its job, right? The interest rate is supposed to somehow you know, indicate the relative scarcity of savings versus potential uses. I'm, I'm speaking very loosely here. And so if the interest rate is artificially low, that's the wrong price. It's going to set things in motion, right? If the market prices have to be right for them to do what they're supposed to do, so if the interest rate's artificially low, that's going to do something bad. And Mises elaborated and said the bad thing is it sets in motion an unsustainable boom. Okay, so the point is it, it makes perfect sense that, oh, yeah, credit expansion would do that. That's how there would be, in a sense, it's like people think there are more savings than there really are. And it makes sense that banks issuing more tickets, more claims on money than people voluntarily relinquished, you know, it it, it fits together. So there's not some weird arbitrary position. It makes perfect sense that Mises would think this, okay? But why is he then endorsing free banking? Well, because again, remember what free banking means, and that's why I was saying there's the quotation marks. I'm a free banker. If what that means is I don't want the Federal Reserve micromanaging bank policy, I think the best thing to do is have completely separate banking and state and money and state and just you know, let, let the chips fall where they may. And we can speculate on what would happen in a totally libertarian legal framework, but for right now, yeah, I don't want the government regulating banks. And Mises says, you know, he, he says at least one spot, I don't know if it's in human action, it might be somewhere else, but he's saying because if, even if the government came in and engaged in 100%, you know, a, a rule about 100% reserves, and by the way, his views on this changed over time. I told you, he does have proposals where he does want the government to at least announce this rule. But as far as regulating banks, he does at least at one point in his career say the public would then trust that that was going to solve the problem. And then the next time there was a serious crisis, the authorities would throw in the towel because you know, they're cowards and they wouldn't be willing to do the hard thing and insist on 100% reserves even though there was a crisis. And they would go ahead and infl- allow inf- inflation. And then, you know, that, that would spoil it. So Mises thought the best long-term approach to, to limit fractional reserve banking is just to, you know, not have the government involved at all. And so the banks that are engaging it too aggressively are going to go under. And Mises has a great argument that we can't get into here. I spell it out in my book, Choice, if you want to get, get that and just look at the chapter on money and banking. Uh, Mises has a great argument about how if one bank tries to inflate too much, its reserves quickly get drained to all of the competing banks. And so that at least would keep any individual bank in check and then the system as a whole couldn't get too risky because then some new person would open up a bank with a higher reserve ratio and all the, be- the reserves would go to that bank. So Mises thought if you had laissez-faire in banking where you regulate them as much as you regulate pizza shops, then at least that would contain the excesses of fractured reserve banking. It wouldn't be 100% reserve banking, there would still be little boom bust cycles, but at least it would contain the major part of the problem. So I think if, if you think that's what he means and you go and read his stuff, it makes perfect sense and there's no, there's no inconsistency. It's not that on Tuesdays he seems to favor Larry, Larry White and George Selgin and on Thursdays he switches to Salerno. It all makes perfect sense. Again, he might be wrong. We're not saying because he said that he's right. But I would say you know, if you believe in Austrian business cycle theory, it's kind of awkward for you if both Mises and Hayek think that credit expansion causes the business cycle. You know, again, it's, it's, I think it's pretty convenient for our point of view. All right, so, so what's the free banker response on this point? Okay, so, and this is, this is neat. So even if you don't care about this stuff per se, 
you like you're, you know, if you're a, especially if you're like a grad student and you know you're not doing this stuff for your dissertation, I would recommend reading enough of this debate to at least see what Selgin says, like in some of his longer uh, pieces on this. So like his book length treatment on free banking, where he he directly addresses this. So to their credit, they don't just dodge this question, and it's a pretty nuanced uh, issue. And so the reason I'm saying you should read it not because you care so much about fractional reserve banking, but because Thinking through what his position is, it does force you to really sit back and just like, how does an economy work? How does, how does the credit market work? And what happens when loans are made and there's credit, you know, and investments and, and saving and what's the definition of saving? And it gets into some really interesting thought experiments. Like when I was preparing for the debate and I was reading Selgin's position, which ended up being more nuanced than I had expected, I really was like pacing around my apartment till 2 a.m. Like, wait a minute, I'm picturing guys making loans of fish and stuff, and it was great. So if you, if you don't want to do that, then don't read this stuff, because it occurred to me that some of you might think, that sounds horrible. I'd rather hibernate for three months. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so what Selgin says is, so he agrees. He says, yes, there's, there's two distinct things going on. We, the free bankers, can lay out the conditions for equilibrium, like so they could, the profit maximizing amount of fractional reserves that a commercial bank will engage in if there's no external regulation. Okay, so they have one train of thought to say, take a, any particular commercial bank in a system of what they call free banking, and then what would its reserve ratio be? It wouldn't be 0%, because then if any customer showed up ever and wanted to take his money out, the bank would go out of business, right? The word would spread in the community, they don't have our money and they would be done for. On the other hand, Selgin says, it wouldn't be 100% reserves. That's too safe. The bank could you know, have 99% reserves and make more profit than at 100% reserves. And yeah, there's a slight chance there could be a bank run and they would run out if they only have 99% of the you know, checking accounts stored as cash in the vault. But come on, what are the chances of that happening? And so they're saying when the bank optimally picks its reserve ratio, balancing the risks of a bank run and, and running out, versus the extra profit from making more loans. Because the banks, the more they lend out, why does a bank want to engage in fractional reserve banking? Because they make more money, right? If they take a ticket and lend it out and say you owe us you know, 1.05 of these tickets next year, that 0.05 is, is pure profit to them or is pure income to them, free and clear. They can destroy that ticket. And so now that claim, that excess claim on the cash in the vault is gone, but the 0.05 in interest that they earned is theirs, free and clear. It's not that you know they got to be careful with that. So they're earning legitimate net. Well, I don't say legit. They are earning income in terms of the accounting. Once you just overlook the, you know the weirdness of it, and so that's why they would do it. Okay, but again, there's a, there's a risk. The more they do it, the riskier. And, all, and so there's like a game theoretic treatment that Selgin and White can engage in, and they have it published, you know, in mathematical journals talking about this stuff. What's the optimum thing, and what's the Nash equilibrium? Blah 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 blah. Okay. And then he says, there's another sense of equilibrium in which the voluntary savings of the community corresponds to the amount borrowed and invested, and that's a different notion of equilibrium. And he says, but it just so happens the two are always going to line up, at least in a free banking regime, where you know the government policies are what we say. And he says that, I can't reproduce it here because it's too complex, but he's saying that when somebody in the community wants to on net accumulate more claim tickets issued by the bank, that person's saving, right? Because he's earning income, he could go spend it, but instead he wants to accumulate tickets. That's an asset, so he's engaging in savings. And that's the only time when it would be profitable for a bank to issue more of, that tick more of those tickets when on net the community wants to hold more. And hence, the banks engage in monetary inflation precisely when people in the community want to save more. So they're saying, see? That they're, they're, they're claiming that keeps interest rates where they should be, that it would arbitrarily make interest rates go artificially high if we insisted on 100% reserves, because then people are scrambling to hold more of these tickets because they want to hold more money for some reason, and then they can't, and so then you have to wait for prices to fall, and there's this painful, sluggish adjustment process. Okay, So that's where they're coming from. Um, they would also point to historical exam examples of what I'll say is close to free banking, for example, Scotland and Canada during the specified years, and they'll say, and these were remarkably stable. Okay, so they got a two-pronged thing. They're going to do the theoretical treatment, which I can't get into. I actually have some articles under review right now, um, but it, it's more of a technical argument where I, I think they're wrong when they say that first point I mentioned, but I'm just saying it is a subtle point. It's interesting to consider. 
The second point, I think, is very weak. So they also appeal to history. And they come, if you've seen the debate that I did with Selgin, let's just say he's not a very timid man, okay? And so he has these sweeping things, and it sounds like, you know, he's obviously done much more research on this. This is his baby. This is his area. And so he'll make sweeping statements like, oh, Scotland during these years of the free banking era was remarkably stable. And the same thing Canada in the late 1800s when they switched over was very unregulated and open to entry and da-da, remarkably stable. Okay, so for Scotland, Rothbard points out, for example, there were a period more than a decade long when the banks suspended specie redemption. Right? They just said, no, you can't turn into the tickets for gold. So that's kind of awkward. That's not what free banking is supposed to be. It's supposed to be they run the risk if they inflate too much and they can't redeem it, then they're done. They got away with doing it for more than a decade, and so clearly there's something going on there where that wasn't free banking. So that's one thing, and it's kind of weird that it takes the Rothbardians to pry that out of the free bankers when they should be announcing that up front and center. As far as Canada, this is the last point I'll end on here. So Selgin pointed to this book, The Canadian Banking System, 18, so this guy wrote this uh, in, the late, in 1895, this expert on Canadian banking, and Selgin was saying this is the authoritative treatment, shows that banking in the late 1800s, what I, George Selgin, would say is one of the best examples of free banking we have in world history, and it was remarkably stable. So I'm looking through the table of contents. I hope you guys can see this. This is the last point I'll mention. So I'm looking through the table of contents to see this remarkable stability, how this is a challenge to the Rothbardian position. And the chapter on this says... Banking under the Confederation, 1867 to 89. First one, the expansion. <laughs> Depression, 1874 to 1879. Bank failures and losses. The bank, I mean, this could have been Rothbard's thesis, right? Like he could have done this instead of the other bank panics. So again, so I think here, again, part of it is they're, they're talking past each other. What George means, if you read through it, is the, this author actually is proud of the performance and he says most depositors got their money back. Right, and so that's this. He's saying not too many people lost their money outright, and so that's why Selgin thinks, look at this. This thing came through, you know, because in George's mind, we always have business cycles, but look at not, not too many people lost their money. This is remarkably stable, okay. Whereas the Rothbardians are saying this is exactly what we said would happen. How is this a you know a refutation of our position? Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you.